Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Unity Church. I'm Reverend Kathleen Rolenz. I have the honor of serving as your interim senior minister. And I'm sharing this morning's service with my colleague, the Minister of Congregational Care, Reverend Lara Cowton, and Worship Associate, Meryl Aldrich, as well as our chalice lighter, Sylvia Campling. I want to extend a special welcome to all of you who are here in person and those of you who are watching us online or those who may be watching this service on our YouTube channel later. We are so delighted you're here. We hope that if you are a visitor or guest, you would fill out a visitor card, put it in the offering plate as it goes by, and, and or stop by the visitor's table after the service so that we can greet you warmly and get to know you a little bit better. We hope that you find Unity Church a place that helps you find and keep your balance, a community that inspires you to lead a loving life of integrity, service, and joy. Your gifts and your wounds are welcome here. We are so delighted to be together this morning. It is a joy. Once again, welcome to Unity Church. Today's call to worship is inspired by a piece by Rachel Rote, who wrote, there is in this place the possibility of healing, of repair, of making things right within ourselves, between us, and with the wider world. There is in this place possibility. And I think... What do we do here, if not envision and expand possibility? What are we about, if not to outline, to draw the shape of possible new outcomes and of potential repair? And as Sylvia now comes forward, we light this chalice today in hopes of such inspiration. Come, let us worship together. Thank you. 
standing. And join me in the responsive reading that's printed in your order of service. <clears throat> the central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind each to all. It is the church that assures us that we are not struggling for justice on our own, but as members of a larger community. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. This is a particularly enjoy, a joyful time in the life of this congregation as we have a ceremony, an in-gathering ceremony, welcoming new members to Unity Church. Laura Park. Good morning, everybody. In some ways, that uh, responsive reading just said everything that I like to say every time we have new members join us um, in the congregation. But I think I'll take this opportunity to say yet again, what does it mean to become a member of Unity Church Unitarian? At this church, we often talk about the commitments of the spiritual life being lived within, among, and beyond. Within, develop personal practice to help you find and keep your balance. Among, Develop the skills of intimacy, small group intimacy, that let you go deep quickly with strangers. Beyond, take the compassion that rises from the practice of the first two, of doing your work within and among, and use it to bless the world. It is a joy today to welcome the newest members of our congregation to join us on that journey within, among, and beyond. It's tempting to think that the membership journey ends when we sign our names to the book that includes the signatures of every member of the church since 1872, but in our living Unitarian Universalist faith tradition, membership is an ongoing process of covenanting and commitment, ever evolving, ever transforming, ever renewing. Joining a church where we ask you to link spiritual an anti-racist multicultural practice to build a double helix scaffold for our shared ministry is a courageous act. This is not an easy or straightforward ask of you or of ourselves, but we don't do it alone. As you, our newest members, commit yourselves to this religious community, know that the congregation commits itself to you as well. To be part of a religious community is to learn how to give and to receive, how to grow and be challenged, how to agree and disagree in love. We are here to help one another live lives of integrity, service, and joy, and to call out the best in each other. This is the commitment that we renew together as a whole congregation today as we honor these wonderful people. Please join me in welcoming the newest members of Unity Church uh, now and in the center room for a reception after the service. And could you please join me here in the chancel as I call your name? Peter Berglund, Michael Brafford, Debbie Harvey, Ingrid Haugen, Eve Johnson Brafford, Linda Madzik Kwaman, and Chris Russert. And two people couldn't be here today, and I just want to name them Bobby Schmitz and Ray Sinclair. And will you all please rise and join me in the new member in gathering litany that's in your order of service. We, the members of Unity Church Unitarian, welcome you and gratefully acknowledge your choice to join with us in the continuing religious life. I become a member of this church, aware of the privileges and responsibilities of membership 
and with the deep feeling that I have come home this day. Ours is a faith which reveres the past, envisions the future, and lives with passion in this moment, even as we honor those who have brought us to this day, so we celebrate your newly found commitment and eagerly anticipate your contributions. I bring to my new family my talents and enthusiasm, my shortcomings and my doubts. I ask you to invite me into opportunities for service. Today, we renew the covenant to seek and speak the truth, to love one another without prejudice, and to respond with concerted efforts to the demands of justice. I share your aspirations, join you in covenant, and hope to build on your example. Now, therefore, united as one family, having affirmed one another in love, let us recite our, our historic bond of fellowship. As those who believe in religion, as those who believe in freedom, fellowship, and character in religion, as those who believe that the religious life means the thankful, trustful, loyal, and helpful life, and as those who believe that a church is a community of helpers, wherein it is made easier to lead such a life, we join ourselves together, name, hand, and heart, as members of Unity Church. Thank you so much and welcome. Each time we gather for worship, we set aside a moment to expand the caring ministry of this congregation. Together, we recognize the cycle of life and death, the circle of love, compassion, and witness that is at the center of this and every sacred community. We stand at the side of parents and teachers and all those whose primary spiritual practice is caring for children. With those who live with chronic pain and grief, with illnesses seen and unseen, with mental disability or addiction. We pray for our neighbors in prison, those who care for family members in ill health, those who struggle with loneliness, and those who strive to stay afloat amidst poverty. Our lives are blessed by those who face their final days with honesty, and by those who rise above heartbreak to challenge oppression in all of its forms. We pray for those in harm's way, for the wisdom and strength of the leaders of the world, and for the people of this courageous congregation, as together we live into our longing to embody and help to build the beloved community. We send our prayers for continued healing to Peter DeLong, who had a bad crash on his mountain bike and broke some vertebrae in his neck. Thankfully, he had no spinal cord injury and is now home recovering with care from his wife, Barry, and children, Francine and Walter. The cards and good wishes are very welcome. They'll be on the congregational care table in the parish hall. We also send healing prayer and energy to Reverend Kinga Reka Tsekeli, 
the minister of Unity's Transylvanian Partner Church in Homoroden, St. Peter, Romania. She's recovering from a recent procedure to improve her circulation and says she's doing well. And of course, our hearts are with the Palestinian and Israeli people. who are besieged by the unfathomable destruction, grief, rage, and horrors of war. We add our voices to their keening wails as we call and pray for peace, peace. Let us share a moment to speak the names of a person or the people aloud or in the silent sanctuary of your heart for whom you care at this moment. Great Spirit of tender mercies and compassion, we are shocked once again by the brutality of war. We fear for the welfare of dear ones in Israel and Palestine and are dismayed at the echoes of intolerance and anger in our own communities. We confess that we sometimes fall short of seeing the inherent worthiness and dignity of every human being and that we have loved with condition and judgment. We confess that we have stayed silent in the face of oppressions and forgotten painful lessons of history. We confess that we often fear what is different and have chosen a path instead of familiar comfort. We have felt powerless to change and are seeking a better way, a way that will shine the light of truth on our path towards healing. We pray for wisdom and strength and courage, courage to make amends, to forgive, and to heal the brokenness in our hearts and in the world. Courage to not fall into despair, but to lift each other up in strengthening our own faith and our hope. I share with you these words from Rabbi Sheila Weinberg, and then invite you to share with me a minute of silent reflection for prayer. Two peoples, one land. Three faiths, one root, one earth, one mother, one sky, one beginning, one future, one destiny, one broken heart. One God. We pray to you. Grant us a vision of unity. May we see the many in the one. And the one in the many.
May you, life of all the worlds, source of all amazing differences, help us to see clearly. Guide us gently and firmly toward one another, toward peace. Good morning. Um, while they set up, I'm going to introduce what they're singing. So, um, thinking about um, Hispanic Heritage Month and Indigenous Peoples Day, mm -hmm. and also thinking about my own history, I am, so for those of you that don't know, I'm Egyptian Mexican. So, on my father's side, uh, I have an Otomi uh, Native American grandmother, a Spanish <laughs> grandfather, and on my mother's side, an Egyptian a grandma and a Palestinian grandpa. So there's a lot mixed up there. And um, this is the song that spoke to me, Why We Build the Wall. I grew up on the border with the US, Ciudad Juarez, where you can see across the border, El Paso, Texas. And right in the middle of the desert, under that beautiful blue sky, the most unnatural thing is this militarized border, this wall just tearing through the landscape. And you can see both sides very clearly. And this song from the musical <laughs> Hades Town is called Why We Build the Wall. And it is not sung by the good guy in the musical, it is sung by Hades, the devil. <laughs> and backed by his chorus of, of lost souls trapped in hell. And they're not trapped in hell with fire and guard dogs and weapons. They're trapped in hell because they are convinced that they must build this wall. And Hades sings the song, builds the song, one brick at a time. Children, why do we build the wall? We build the wall to keep us free. And how does the wall keep us free? It keeps out the enemy. And how does it, who is the enemy, children? The enemy is poverty and the wall builds. Um, when the 2016 election came around, this song gained a lot of relevance, you know? There were a lot of chanting of build the wall, but she wrote it almost 10 years before Trump was even a thing in politics. She was thinking about all the walls, um, not just that wall, but the walls separating people of different faiths, the walls that put away people in reservations, the walls that take the form of freeways that divide you know, very rich neighborhoods from very disenfranchised neighborhoods. And um, I think there's a real powerful grain of truth to this song. So this is Why We Build the Wall, featuring Mark Dietrich as Hades.
Why do we build the wall? My children, my children, why do we build the wall? How does the wall keep us free? My children, my children, how does the wall keep us free? We have what they have not, my children, my children, because they want what we have got. What do we have that they should want? My children, my children. What do we have that they should want? The war is never won. The enemy is the enemy. poverty. The wall keeps out the enemy. And we build the wall to keep us free. That's why we build the wall. We build the wall to keep us free. Once a year, in the dark of the world, dark of the year, we wash the whole world in a day. For one day, we cry until they're home, until they all are home. These things we gather in this blanket, bone and sand and sage, we wash the world. Between us, hold this blanket, fill it with our tears, and when we have cried from one dawn to the next, then we will rise and we will dance until they are home, until they all are home. 
Lay your hands upon the truth of beauty's loss. Heavy, soft as moss, this blanket full of tears and dust and dying becomes ocean cradle, healing dark, the promise. Washed clean by our sorrow, today crying out as we're birthing tomorrow. Not so much redemption as the law of moon and season calls for justice. One day the lawmakers must exit their echoing halls, fall in with the grandmothers dancing, carry it, cry it clean until they're home, until they all are home. Their names were Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron, and they had been missing for seven months. Their families had taped up missing person posters and canvassed the area around Winnipeg, Manitoba, but no one had heard or seen these two women. But it wasn't only the story of the missing women that caught the attention of the Winnipeg Free Press and that caught my attention this past summer while visiting my relatives in Manitoba. It was the story of their deaths that made the front page news. Morgan, Harris, and Mercedes Myron were members of the Long Plain First Nation, and the police discovered that they had been the victims of a serial killer who preyed on indigenous women. And investigators had determined that their remains had been dumped in the Prairie Green landfill just north of Winnipeg. The headline of this tragic story was the demand of the victims' families and their communities that the landfill be searched and that their remains brought home to their families, to a, their tribe for a proper burial. And the Winnipeg police forensics chief said that searching the landfill for their bodies was not operationally feasible, concluding that it was unsafe for those who would conduct the search and likely not provide the closure that the victim's family so desperately wanted. Well, the newspaper blew up with differing opinions. The mostly white Canadians who wrote letters to the editor sided with the police chief that the safety of the searchers was more important. And given the enormity of the cost of the search, it was not worth the risk. But members of the Long Plain Nation felt otherwise. One of the victim's sisters, Jordan Myron, said, Canadian officials have made so many prom promises to indigenous people this is just showing that nothing has changed. If this was a white woman in the landfill, there would have been no question that there would have been a search. When a nation of people has been traumatized for centuries, when their land is stolen, when their culture and traditions are suppressed, when their legitimacy is denied, and when the most vulnerable among them, namely women, go missing, it's not hard to believe that the dominant white culture is less interested in justice. And Kathy Merrick, the Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba's Chiefs said, we can easily talk about reconciliation, but when there's no action to it, it's meaningless. 
Not too long after the posters went up for Morgan and Mercedes, so did the red dresses begin to appear around the site of the landfill. The red dress project began as an art installation to draw attention to the more than 1,000 missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada. And I first saw the display created by artist Jamie Black at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. It is stunningly simple and powerful. Red dresses, like the ones you encountered on the way into church this morning, hung on trees, serving as a visual reminder of the staggering number of women who are no longer with us. And the installation evokes a presence through the marking of absence. The red dresses point to the need for something to be done, attention to be paid, redress, is required. It's a brilliant play on words because to redress something means to remedy or set right an undesirable or unfair situation. And redress also means a remedy or compensation for a wrong or a grievance. So as we look at October's theme of confess, confessing, and as we dive into the UU Common Read, Dania Ruttenberg's book on repentance and repair, our work this month, our reflection this month, has been on the individual and now on the collective need for reconciliation and repair. So we explore not only what it looks like in our personal lives, but what it looks like on a national level. And repentance and repair are the early stages of the process, as described in Dan in, in uh, Ruttenberg's book. But the next step is reparations. When U.S. Uh, Representative John Conyers first submitted a proposal to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans in 1989, that proposal and John Conyers was seen as tilting at windmills. Conyers sponsored that bill every year until his death in 2019. No one believed that reparations to the descendants of chattel slaves were ever going to happen. But increasingly, the idea that the United States could confess their racism and then pay reparations for lost wages, opportunities denied, the creation of a persistent underclass that permeated all aspects of American life, from housing to economic advancement to segregation, and that maybe to repair this original wound would require some form of reparations, has become increasingly relevant to our conversations. So this month of confessing is intended to look at both the harms done to human beings and how to repair them and how to explore, done to a har explore the harm done to people, not just in the past, but the harm that is perpetuated throughout the nation to this day and take steps to try to heal and repair that harm. So this is confession and redress writ large. You know, I do have to say, before I continue, I want to acknowledge that I cannot talk to you about reparations for descendants of chattel slavery and reparations for indigenous tribes and peoples all in one sermon. To do so would be a disservice to both. They both require deep study and reflection. However, for this Sunday, knowing that next month is Native American Heritage Month, and building on the fine program of this past Wellspring Wednesday, which was on the doctrine of discovery, or more accurately described, the doctrine of domination. I wanted to use this Sunday to consider more deeply how we may confess and redress through reparations the grave injustices that have been done in the past continues to permeate to the present of indigenous peoples in this land, the land we inhabit. And to lean into that conversation a little further, I want to go back to a powerful reflection that was written by former worship associate Ray Wiedemeyer 
which in part inspired my own thinking for today's sermon. I've never forgotten it, and I want to read you an excerpt with Ray's permission. Ray wrote this. He said, on the Sacred Sites tour here in the Twin Cities, led by Jim Jim Bear Jacobs, a member of the Stockbridge Munsee Mohican Nation, I once again heard the history of indigenous peoples in Minnesota, but I was also visiting the land where that history took place. It was during that tour that Jim Bear spoke very simply and clearly about the broken promises the broken treaties that would remove the vast majority of indigenous people from the land that is now the Twin Cities, and eventually how they would be removed almost totally from Minnesota. During that tour, I realized that I was part of the story. I own land in St. Paul on the homelands of the Dakota and Jibbeway nations, and I own land in Wisconsin a mile or two from the scattered bits of the St. Croix Chippewa Reservation, where 3.8 square miles are all this group have left of their original homelands that once covered thousands of square miles in northern Wisconsin. And then a little later in the reflection, Ray asked himself and us, how do I move from discomfort to right action? Do I give back the land? How do, I, how do I live in right relationship? Do I pay tribes rent on the land I now own? Do I find other ways of giving back that aren't about money? How do I work to create le- relationship with those who have been harmed? How do I honor and respect their culture and make proper amends? End quote. It's the same question that many of us would ask ourselves, and in fact, we need to have a national conversation about what would meaningful reparations look like. How would this country be different? What would those of us who are not native to this land have to give up? And I want to commend the work of our indigenous justice team and Becky gonzalez Campoy, who has written extensively in our newsletter about reparations and indigenous justice which you can go back and find on our church's website, by the way. And in their series last year, the question that kept haunting us is what does it mean to take responsibility for a past that's not past? Minnesota Dakota professor and activist Wazian Tawin offers one response. She looks not necessarily to divest white Minnesotans of their private land holdings, But she also looks to find ways to enfranchise the Dakota community today. And the first place to start begins with a critical role of public confession, of truth-telling, in repentance work for harm caused at a national level. Wazia Tawin writes, Quote, to many Minnesotans, truth-telling may seem an unnecessary educational goal because there is no awareness of a denial of truth. This means that well-intentioned people who ordinarily would be horrified at the notion of being complicit in the cover-up of genocide and the ongoing denial of justice for indigenous peoples have done just that. But then she goes on to say this. She says, truth-telling has the potential to alleviate the burden that all of us carry. Dakota people who carry historical trauma and the pain of ongoing oppression and white Minnesotans who carry the burden of maintaining oppressive systems. Truth-telling allows us to relieve those burdens and take the next step towards justice. So the critical role in confessing is in its potential to liberate victims of great harm, making the end to the denial of their experience and the affirmation of the legitimacy of their suffering. And again, I want to go back to Rabbi Rutenberg, who also notes that this process can be liberating for the perpetrators as well 
Rutenberg says, it engages the possibility that what was done was not, was not what had to be done. It enables those who acted wrongly to engage with the immorality of their actions. It opens the door to accountability and repentance. And here's the critical part, to becoming different. We cannot change the past, yet we can change the future, but only if we are honest about what has been and who was harmed and who caused that harm. It's really hard to have a national conversation about repentance and repair and how to redress the wrongs done if our nation refuses to acknowledge harm. The state of Florida is leading the movement to ban lessons on things like race and gender identity from public schools and workplaces because they make some people feel guilty. The national movement to ban conversations or teachings about critical race theory, which addresses systemic and institutional racism in the United States, has gained a following. Under Florida's individual freedom bill, the definition of discrimination is broadened I'm not kidding here, to include making another person feel uncomfortable over historical actions by their race, nationality, or gender. Now, if that is not the definition of white fragility, I do not know what is. And likewise is the belief that telling the truth about the horrors of attempted genocide of millions of indigenous people would be forbidden because it makes some people uncomfortable or even feel bad about America's past is a dangerous and harmful movement and must be countered forcibly, forcefully. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> For a meaningful conversation to happen about reparations, we as human beings must see ourselves as both perpetrators of harm and those who can change it. And that's what this entire month of confessing is all about. If you are a white person or a non-indigenous person, I want to say clearly this is not about making you feel guilty for the sins of your ancestors. It's about taking ownership of the truth. It is about soul searching. It's about building the capacity to hold conflicting truths in your heart and mind. If you are a white, non-native Minnesotan, it's about your willingness to confront the human capacity for greed, for bias, for genocide, for prejudice, for evil. Because we make ourselves the hero of every story. When we make ourselves the hero of every story, we make someone else the villain. Those natives were savages, our ancestors tell us. They must be civilized. So we'll strip them of their culture. We will put their children in residential schools. We will take them from their land. We will Christianize them and insist that they be grateful. When we make ourselves the hero of the nation's narrative, we say that slavery is part of the biblical story and that we are simply doing God's will. By doing so, we other another and we justify the harm. When we question the police's interaction with a young black man, we wonder, well, why didn't he just do what he was told? Or a woman's assault, why was she walking home all by herself? You see, these are spiritual questions with political ramifications. But when we human beings can say, I am part of all that is, I am the beauty of nature, I'm the beauty of the fawn, and I am the wolf that attacks the fawn, only then may we make meaningful redress for harms committed. And again, I refer to Rabbi, Rabbi Rutenberg when she says, truth-telling must not be a single event, but rather a part of an ongoing work of becoming different, of transformation. That's what we're doing here each and every Sunday and throughout the week. We don't have all the answers. We don't profess perfection. But each time you question your own reactivity, each time you try to believe yourself to be innocent, the act of confessing is a helpful and necessary corrective. It keeps us humble. 
to know that despite our big brains, our intellect, our wisdom, our knowledge, despite our technology, our advancements, there exists within the human heart a complex truth, a naughty DNA of power and control, of greed and benevolence, of lies and justification and truth-telling and honesty. What does this truth-telling look like? I don't yet fully know. But I do know the willingness to have our assumptions challenged, to be partners in the struggle for justice, can only result in a more inclusive and truly more just nation. I ask, as Rabbi Ruttenberg does, she says, will the United States ever hold a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for slavery, for structural racism, for indigenous land theft, genocide, and oppression? Will it ever look with curiosity at what making amends, repair, and true transformative change might look like? She concludes with this question. She concludes those questions with, I don't know. I hope so. I hope so, too. What I do know is that as a nation, we build walls out of fear to keep out the other, the stranger, the non-Christian, the non-native born. Our ancestors built reservations to limit power, potential, and culture of indigenous people. We build physical walls out of fear that this nation does not have enough resources to accommodate those who seek a safe harbor. And we build emotional and political walls against the idea that white Americans owe anything to people of color or to indigenous communities. This is hard work. This is heart work. It is the work that is needed for us to do. For if not us, who? And if not now, when? What is at stake is not only a historical reckoning, but the entire structures on which this country was built. And that is indeed a very threatening prospect for those who benefit from white supremacy. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, many of us are yearning for a different way of being, for a new vision of how to structure a country, a people, a world that is literally built on equity and justice instead of greed and domination. That's the world worth fighting for. That's the dream worth achieving. That's a life worth living. That's a nation worth building, and it's one that is not yet achieved. But my prayer is that each and every one of us will be partners in the work together until we can all call each other home. I'm Helen Polig, a member of Unity's Indigenous Justice Community Outreach Ministry Team. In recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day this past week, we sponsored one of the Wellspring Wednesday programs, and we have nominated today's recipient of the larger portion of this week's offering. I don't know how many of you are aware that in the late 1800s, the Dakota people who had historically occupied much of southern Minnesota were forcibly removed from the state and it was made illegal for them to live in Minnesota. Makochi Ikichupi means land recovery in the Dakota language. It is an indigenous-led project of reparative justice on Dakota land in Minnesota. The organization has three main goals the return of Dakota land, the revitalization of Dakota culture, and the renewal of the environment. Makochi Ikichupi seeks to bring some Dakota people home, to reestablish their spiritual and physical relationship with their homeland, and to ensure ongoing existence of Dakota people. 
Two villages of Earth Lodges are currently under construction in Mountain Lake and Granite Falls, where Dakota people can live following traditional practices of sustainability. In August, I had the opportunity and truly the honor of participating in a work and learn day at the village in Mountain Lake. I cannot overemphasize how important this project is to Dakota people who want to return to their traditional homelands. I hope you will join me in giving generously to this project. Will the ushers please come forward? Please remember those who gave to you and now with generosity give back to others. We hope you have found rich meaning in today's service, and we'll take that inspiration out into your engagement with the church and into your life beyond the church. There's just a few things to draw your attention to before we conclude, many of which can be found in your This Week at Unity, but there are a couple of things that um, you should know about. The Congregational Survey's deadline to be completed is October 23rd, so please do take a minute to fill out the Congregational Survey. Um, this is for our ministerial search team and the process and search for a settled ministry. 
Also note that Director of Transitions, Reverend Keith Cron, will be here two Saturdays from now. He'll also be leading the worship service. He's um, going to be here on the 28th and from about 9.30 to 11.30, and we're going to have a pancake breakfast before that at 8 a.m., so do, um, do please come. And then finally, this is the church's uh, month where we collect your pledges for the upcoming year. And your annual pledges determine uh, what programs and staff that we will be able to support in the year ahead. So please do turn in your pledges by October 31st. And then finally, after the service, uh, we'll be in the foyer. would love to greet you on your way to Parish Hall for coffee, tea, or refreshments and further conversation. Our closing hymn, number 22, Dear Weaver of Our Life's Design. Remember the promise of this day, for today is crying out as we are birthing tomorrow, washed clean by our sorrow, strengthened by our hope for a better future, resolved to make it so. Our worship has ended. Let our service now begin. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>